So glad to be here with you. And uh, I have a message for you this morning from the gospel of Jesus Christ. I thought I'd do something different. <laughs> but look at uh, Satan in the life of Jesus. Uh, I'm going to do the verse that's found in Mark. It's recorded in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And I'll be referring to Matthew and Mark. As usual, we have three reporters <coughs> reporting on the same event. Each one will include some details that the other one does not. In Mark, he has most of the details, but Luke includes some things that aren't in Matthew and Mark, and Matthew includes some things that aren't in Mark or Luke. So I'll be referencing them. And it's, uh, I guess if we wanted to give this a title, I would say uh, it's a miracle wrapped in a miracle. That would be what the title would be. I don't know the title of my sermons, but if you want to turn to the fifth chapter of the Gospel of St. Mark, and we're going to begin at verse 21. And uh, we're just going to consider this wonderful story as it unfolds in the pages of Holy Scripture. Beginning in verse 21 of the Gospel of St. Mark, the fifth chapter. And when Jesus was passed over again by ship unto the other side, much people gathered unto him, and he was nigh unto the sea. Now in Luke 8.40, he adds a detail about that. It says, uh, it came to pass that when Jesus returned, the people gladly received him, for they were all waiting for him. They were expecting him. They were waiting for him. So that's a little detail that embellishes this lovely story. Verse 22, And behold, there cometh one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name, and when he saw him, he fell at his feet. Now in Matthew 9, 18, it says, And he worshipped him. That's an important detail. He fell at his feet, but he also worshipped him. Those who come to Christ must understand who they're coming to. And misery should always place itself right in the face of mercy, but with a worshipful attitude. It's the king of kings, the king of the glory we're coming to. And even though he loves us, we must remember he is a holy God. And he besought him greatly, saying, My little daughter lieth at the point of death. I pray thee, come and lay thy hands on her, that she may be healed, and she shall live. Now Luke 8.42 says it was his only child. That's important, that little detail. He had a daughter, he had one child, and she was dying. And Jairus uh, implored him to come. It's uh, Jesus is attracted to faith, to those who believe in him. And it says, and Jesus went with him. That's a lovely detail, he went with him. Spurgeon wrote this, he says, the path of Christ is radiant with loving kindness. He is a swift arrow of love, which not only reaches its ordained target, but perfumes the air through which it flies. The path he took that day from where he met Jairus to that place, every inch he traveled, was perfumed with his loving kindness, with the glory of his presence, with the wondrous things he was about to say and do, and so it is even now. And the people followed him, much people. Matthew 8, 5, 15 says, there's a big crowd. It says, and they thronged him. Thronged the some nego is the Greek word that means to crush. This is important. You get this picture. He's walking along this road and public highways in Israel were at least nine feet wide according to qualified legally as a public highway. And it was a river of people. And Jesus is walking along his disciple around and they're all bumping into him. It's important to get this detail. They're, they're squeezing him. They're crushing him. He can hardly move. This, this word crushed, thronged, sumnik was a very uh, vivid, uh, unpleasant word about being crushed. And while he's walking along, verse 25, a certain woman, which had an issue of blood 12 years, and had suffered many things of many physicians, and had spent all that she had, and was nothing better, but rather grew worse. When she had heard of Jesus, she came in the press behind and touched his garment. The issue of blood, uh, Luke describes it, he says it was incurable. It was a hemorrhaging. It was a condition that made her ceremonially impure. That means nobody could touch her. She was not only suffering, pain, but she was put off to the side. It was almost like being a leper. Nobody would hug her. Nobody would touch her. She was by herself. Have you ever felt that way? And nobody could cure her. And she said she spent all she had, all she had, and nothing better but rather grow worse. Have you ever had that happen to you? 
You go to six doctors, you get six different diagnoses, 14 different prescriptions, you get the same problem you had when you left. Has that ever happened to you? You know people that's happened to you? Things haven't changed, have they? You're going to notice what happens here when the great physician comes. The healer. She goes to the right person whose diagnosis is always correct and whose healing is always perfect, instantaneous. And by the way, there's no copay with Jesus. You don't have to wait six months to get an appointment. And then another four weeks to get the results of your test back in the mail. Our health care system up here has been on the disgraceful side, if you ask me. And uh, that's, uh, I use the word disgraceful very carefully. I think it's a correct word. And she, she grew worse. And when she had heard of Jesus, there it is again. She heard of him. Who was it that told her? All these unidentified people. What was the name of that little boy whose lunch fed 5,000 people? Who was his name? Who was he like? How did this woman know of him? In her misery, in her despair, in her suffering, in her isolation of being alone from everybody, somewhere, sometime, somehow, somebody said, have you heard of this Jesus, this prophet from Nazareth? He's raising the dead. He's going to be sight to the blind. He does miracles. Go see him. There's hope for you. He can fix what's broke. He can fix what's broke with all of us, too. Sometimes it's just a little thing that's broke. Sometimes it's a big thing. It doesn't make any difference how big or little it is. Christ can fix it. And she heard the word, she heard of him, and she acted on it. She said, I must go find him. This is the beauty of this story. Of all those who seek him. If you seek him, you will find him. You have this promise on that. If you search for me with all your heart, I shall be found of you, saith the Lord. And I think Jesus knew this little woman was looking for him. You'll see what happens here. And there's a lesson for us all in this. She heard of Jesus. She came. She heard and she came. <laughs> Go and see. Come, come and see, go and tell. And touched his garment. For she said, if I may but touch his clothes, I shall be made whole. Well, here she says clothes. And uh, in Mark 9, 20, it says she, she, Jesus says she, she touched him. But then in Luke 8, 44, she touched the hem of his garment. The hem. Now, this is the garment she's talking about. This is a tell you a prayer shawl. A Jewish boy was given this prayer shawl at his bar mitzvah. He carried it all of his life. He was buried with it. It's a prayer garment that's described by God in Deuteronomy, Leviticus, and, and in uh, Numbers. A Jew, when he was walking, when he was praying, he would have it over his head, like so. This is a small tallit. He, he would carry it like this. He put it over his head to pray. When he was walking, he would fold it over his shoulder, I'm going somewhere. This is bear with me here. It would be folded, and he would carry it over his shoulder. Actually, it would be folded the other way. Give me a second here. There's a correct way to fold this when it says they saw the napkin in the tomb folded by itself. Remember that, John? That was a prayer shawl. It was folded like the American flag was folded in a certain way, so that they knew that it had to be a Jew that did that. Only a Jew would know how to fold a tallit, and only Jesus would take the time to fold it in the tomb before he left. He would wear it over his shoulder like this. So he'd be walking, and the word hem, if you look it up in your concordance, is craspedon. At the four corners of these are these little fringes called zitzit. There's a series of coils and knots. There's a number for each of these coils. The number equals the consonants for the name of Jesus, the name of God, Y-H-V-H, Jehovah, is found in this. This represents the name of God. These represent the laws of God. The Jews believe that by having contact with the name of God, now, this woman touched the hem of his garden. Jesus is walking like this. It's over his shoulder. It's down low. Remember that throng of people? It was a forest of legs moving, surrounding Christ as he walked. The only way she could touch the hem of his garment was get down on her knees and crawl to him and reach up to touch this craspedon, this twisted fringe that represents the name of God as he walked by. She had to humble herself to go down and touch this. But when she did, something happened. Something happened miraculous. Well, Jesus is the God of miracles. She says, By touch his clothes, I shall be made whole. And straight away, one of Mark's favorite words, the fountain of her blood was dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of the plague. And Jesus immediately, knowing in himself that virtue had gone out of him, turned about the press and said, Who touched my clothes? And then Lucas says, Who touched me? It was him she was trying to touch. But maybe because of reverence, she didn't want to actually touch him but touch the hem of his garment. 
He stopped, and virtue, the Greek word is dunamis, that means power. You get the word dynamite from that. He felt something go out of him. He knew he had been touched. And he said, who touched him? And his disciples said unto him, Thou seest the multitudes thronging thee, and sayest thou, who touched me? They were encouraging, what do you mean, who touched you? Everybody's bumping into you. Everybody's pressing you. But Jesus knew the difference. Somebody touched him with a different thing of faith. There's people like this in churches today. A throng gather around, but nobody touches him. They come in, they go, they sing a song, they do a few things, and they go home the same way that they came. With the same burdens they had, the same sins, the same sicknesses. This woman touched him. She meant business. She wanted to have contact with God. And the way you do that is to touch Christ. When you touch him, you're touching God. And there's people like that in churches that come to a worship service. And they never really touch him. They come in, they go home. There was never been that moment when they said, oh, Jesus, I'm here for you. I felt that while you were singing. I felt in, a, in the voices of some of you who were singing, you were singing to him. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full to his wonderful face, you sung. And just when my eyes closed, I could hear people who were singing that from here. You know, when you touch him, he touches you back. And you know it. And he looked round about to see her that had done this thing. But the woman fearing, I like that, this, this uh, <coughs> there could be, uh, faith could be feeble and weak and trembling, but Christ would always respond to her. She was fearful, trembling, knowing what was done in her, what was done in her. Something had happened to her. She knew it. She knew she had been cured. She felt it. You know, in the second chapter of John, we have his first miracle, the turning of water into wine at Cana. And he told his Mary, the mother told him, take these water jars and fill them with water. And the servants took empty water jars, filled them with water, brought them to Christ, brought them back, and looked in and saw wine in them instead of water. And people didn't know how it happened, but the scripture says in John chapter 2, verse 9, but the servants which drew the water knew... That whole crowd around there, all the three were throwing around Jesus, didn't know what happened. But that little woman knew something happened. She drew the water. She drew the power out of Christ. She felt this touch in her body. He's alive today. He wants to do the same thing he did here. And the church of Jesus Christ in our country needs to wake up and crawl in and touch the hem of his garment when he's passing by and feel his power coming to you. He yearns to do for his people what he did then. He says, I am the Lord, I change not. He says, I'm the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's the same Christ today that was there. But he's even better because he's here all the time. He could be in this church, the church across the street, the church down the road, all at the same time. If we avail ourselves of that. She fell down at his feet and told all the truth. And he said unto her, daughter, isn't that lovely? Daughter. A term of affection, a term of respect, Term of love and one daughter. He didn't say, hey you, hey lady, what'd you do? Daughter, my daughter, my child. You know, it's just it's so typical of him. Everything he does is lovely. God can't touch anything but to turn it into something beautiful. He can't say anything unless it's something beautiful. Everything he does is wrought with beauty and loving kindness. This great and wonderful God. Daughter, thy faith hath made thee whole. Go in peace and behold thy prey, of thy plague. Now, this word here, whole, is uh, sozo in Greek. It means saved. In other words, you've been healed, but you've been saved. A lot more happened to her than just getting rid of that issue of blood. That fountain was dried up. And the physical issue was clear. But, but there was more to her touch than that. She believed who he was. And he knew it. He knew, she knew, that he was God. And she came to him humbly, bowing down, crawling through a forest of legs, reaching up her hand, probably getting bumped and bruised as he went by just to touch the hem of his garment. And he always recognizes those who are looking for him. You know, that's why he lingered for Mary Magdalene at the tomb. He waited for her, she knew. You know, the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself perfect in behalf of those whose heart is right towards him, <clears throat> to show himself strong there. Second Chronicles 16, 9 is a wonderful verse. When you're looking for him, he's looking for me. I just think that's a miracle. It's the miracle of God. <coughs> I want us to get this. I don't know about the other churches. They're not my calling. This is my calling. This is where God has planned me. I don't know about them and other pastors, but I know about you. I know what I want by this church. 
I want you all to have that same kind of faith. Because boy, when you do, buckle your seatbelt, put on your helmet, your crash helmet, you're in for a rock. You think that 1200 cc Harley is going to give you, what do you get on this machine? <laughs> this is really going to take you places you've never been before. Remember what Spurgeon says, if we could just live in the world of faith, we would enter in a world of miracles, and we don't even know now. I wonder what happened to this woman as she went along. And while he spake, he's doing one miracle. The ruler of the synagogue came and said, Jairus, thy daughter is dead. Why trouble us thou the master any further? He's doing one miracle, and he gets another one. It's a real miracle wrapped in a miracle. It's kind of a supernatural two-for-one sale here. <laughs> Jesus, he's always got time for you. It's too late, she's dead. Now, nobody wants to get that kind of news. I was looking for that verse Wednesday night, Psalm 112, 7, now I remember it. His heart is steadfast, trusting in the Lord, he will not be afraid of evil tidings. Well, this guy just got evil tidings, Jairus. Your daughter's dead. How's that for evil tidings? Her, his only child. Isn't it funny? This woman had the issue of blood for 12 years, and this little girl was 12 years old. There's a whisper. What is 12 the number of in the kingdom of God? 12 tribes, 12 disciples, the 12 levels, levels of the gate in heaven. 12 is a symbol of the government of God, and the government of God is under the banner of his Christ. <coughs> and uh, as soon as Jesus heard the word was spoken, he saith unto the ruler of the synagogue, this Jairus, be not afraid, only believe. Well, there we have it again. We're talking about this Wednesday night. The opposite of faith is fear. The opposite of fear is faith. Of course this man was afraid. He was afraid when he came to Jesus that his daughter would die before Jesus got there. Now his daughter is dead and he's afraid. And he says, only believe. Pistuo is the noun form. Pistis, which is the, the, the verb form. And faith is a verb. The word here, pistuo, means to put your weight on. Again, I use the illustration, you all came in, you just sat down in your chair. You didn't pick it up and examine it to see if it would hold you. You just sort of ease yourself into it slowly. It's just gonna, you just sat down. Never had a doubt this chair is going to hold you up. Jesus said, say, believe me that way. Just put your weight on. Your whole weight. This isn't easy to do. There's this veil, this translucent, invisible, ephemeral veil that separates us from the world of unbelief to the world of belief. And when you seek to pass through that veil, he rends it from top to bottom. So you pass through into the world of belief if you just want to take that step. There's a mystery in the kingdom of God this way. Only believe, and he suffered no man to follow him, save Peter and James and John, the brother of James. This is one of three cases where Jesus took the inner circle with him. Peter, James, and John. He took them for Jairus' daughter. He took them when he was transfigured in Matthew 17. And he took them to Gethsemane, these three. Went with them on those three occasions. And he came to the ruler, the house of the ruler of the synagogue, and seeth the tumult, and them that wept and wailed greatly. And when he was coming, he saith unto them, Why make ye this to do and weep? The damsel is not dead, but sleepeth. I don't know how he said that. I can imagine two ways. Why make you this to do? He, she's not dead, but she's sleeping. Or he could have said it. Sure, why are you crying? She's not really dead. She's just taking a nap. Watch it happen. I don't know how he said it. But the next verse is interesting. And they laughed him to scorn. They laughed him to scorn. What a blasphemous, impudent moment. They laughed at Jesus. They're still laughing at Jesus. They laugh at you. They laugh at your Christ, your Bible, your church. They laugh at the things of God. Let them laugh. Imperious man, rebellious man, he wallows impudently in the excrement of his own sin and perversions, shaking his muck-covered fist in the face of a holy God. And he says, he's not really there. He doesn't see. He'll never notice, but he is there. He does see, and he will notice. And the time will come in that awful, horrible day when they stand before the judgment seat of Christ and they see the wrath of this angry God come upon them, but they're going to stop laughing. So be patient with these ones. When they laugh at you, pray for them. They don't know what they're doing. They just don't know the truth. When they scorn God, as these people did, have pity upon them. Pray that they will come to know them and be delivered from the wrath that is to come. Be able to face God as their king and their father, not as their executioner. Oh, they laugh. He that sitteth in the hands shall laugh. That verse bothers me when I think of somebody laughing at my Jesus, who just healed one woman and is on his way to raise somebody from the dead. What did he ever do that he deserved scorn? 
But when he had put them all out, notice I said, get out of here. He taketh the father and the mother of the damsel, and then that were with him, and entereth in where the damsel was lying. Well, somebody's about to laugh pretty soon. Because that father and mother are about to go in there and see their dead child. And then they're going to see, take him, Jesus, take her by the hand and raise him up. You don't think they laughed when they saw that? You don't think their sorrow was turned into joy? Their mourning turned into dancing? That they rejoiced that they had their child back. What a moment this is. The electricity, the vibrancy, the life and the power of that moment will be yours when you stand before Christ. When we see his face, when we know this whole thing we've been talking about down here on earth is real. There is a God and I'm looking at him, he's looking at me. And I see his eyes weeping in joy and love, looking at me and I feel enveloped by the love and the certainty of heaven. I'm here, I've made it. We're going to have a little bit of that moment that they had down here. What I'm telling you is not a calling me devised fable. I'm preaching to you the truth. This is truth because Jesus says it. God says it. And God can't lie. Why would he lie to me? What if Jesus asked me, was he rich and powerful? Did he wear $500 silk suits with a matching tie and handkerchief? Did he have three private jets? And live? No, he didn't. He had nothing. He just came to love and to give. Why don't we believe him? And he took the damsel by the hand and saith unto her, Talitha kumi. Which is being interpreted, damsel, I say unto thee, arise. There's a difference between interpretation and translation. One of the gifts of the Spirit is not to get the translation, it's to get the interpreter. It's not a word for word translation. So this Talitha kumi, which means a little lamb, literally, literally little lamb, get up. But you see the word talit, T-A-L-I-T. This is a talit. When a Jewish rabbi would pray for somebody, he would cover them with his talit. He would place it over them, and he would pray for them. When he would marry people, he would place this over the head of the bride and groom, put his hands on him and pronounce a blessing. So that the, the, the interpretation is one thing. The translation is, she that is covered with the talit, get up. Rise and shine. Wakey, wakey. <laughs> you know... Arise and straight away the damsel arose and walked. For she was the age of 12 years. Could you like to have seen that? Can you imagine? She's dead. They knew what death was like. You can tell there's no breath, there's no movement, there's no pulse. The body is getting cooler rather than warmer. You can tell when somebody's dead or not. I've seen it. Some of you have seen it too. You know death when you see it. She arose and walked, and I think about that. I went out how she rose and walked. I remember, I mentioned that once a couple years ago here. And that marvelous scene in the third chapter of Acts. Peter and John come out of the temple. And there's that man who's been crippled from his, from his mother's womb all of his life. And Peter, fastening his eyes upon him, and John said, look on us. And he gave heed and them, expecting to receive something. And Peter said, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have, I give thee in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Rise and walk, and he took him by the hand, like Jesus took Jairus' daughter by the hand, and lifted him up, and immediately his strength and his ankle bones were received strength. And he, leaping up, stood and walked and entered with them, walking and leaping and praising God. Look at the energy, the explosion of verbs. I remember, there was probably some of that in, in that room when the daughter came back. You know, that we prayed for somebody who lost a three-year-old child just a little while ago. That woman believes in this Christ, she's going to see that child again. There's going to be the same kind of giving that baby back that we saw with Jairus. When you lose a child, like my wife and I lost three kids in, in, in miscarriages before we had our, our second child. Those are three children I'm going to meet because they're up there someplace. I'm going to have three little ankle biters, three cute little cup punchers come running up to me and have to say, Daddy, that's going to be a happy moment when that comes. And uh, they were astonished with great astonishment. Well, I guess so, wouldn't you be? You know, it's not like a good miracle to wake you out of lethargy. It's not like God does a great miracle and all of a sudden you're awake and alive to his reality. Faith is a way of living, breathing, expecting him. Faith is acting like you believe that what God said is true. And when you do that, he honors you. All of us here, all of us, there's nobody here, not me, not any of you who is where God wants us to be. He says to me, go, go down deeper, come up higher. He says to all of you by name, wherever you are in your walk, I love you, I'm happy where you are, add a girl, add a boy, but keep coming up, there's more, there's more. Way out to the water, up to the ankles, it said in Ezekiel's vision, then up to the knees, up to the hips, a great river that cannot be passed over. And Paul spoke of thinking about great mysteries of God, that you go deeper and higher and you experience them, and that's where a whole new life is. And then this ends, how am I doing? Not too bad. 10, 20, not as bad as last week. I apologize for doing so long. I don't apologize for preaching, but I was six minutes over. Isn't that terrible? Anyway, 
And he charged them straightly that no man should know it. Now look at how this ends. Every time we read the last phrase of this verse, I just shake my head in wonder. This is the last verse. He charged them straightly that no man should know it. And he commanded something should be given her to eat. He raised her from the dead and he says, make her a sandwich. <laughs> Do you see that? Isn't that wonderful? The same God that gave her life will give her what she needs to sustain that life. The same God that points you to a task will give you the strength to perform that task. He'll give you everything you need to complete the journey. His attention to details. She's going to be hungry. She's been dead for a while. I guess that can make you hungry. I don't know. But he was even considerate of these little things. Was it enough? He could have said, well, she's alive now. I'll take care of her. No, she's going to be hungry. I just love him for his, his courtesy, his kindness, his anticipation of what your needs would be. <clears throat> so if you're dying, he can give you life. <clears throat> if you're hungry, he can give you a sandwich. <laughs> he can make something for you. It's a wonderful guy to be served. Aren't you glad you came to worship him today when you see this? <laughs> I, mean, I read about it. I say, boy, I'm sure glad I'm one of yours, Lord. I'm sure glad I'm a Christian. I thank God for the truth of his holy word. Well, it's a miracle and a miracle. It's just like our Jesus, just another day in his life. Just one more day in his life of the things that he does. And remember, he's the same. He's the same. When, when death whispers to you, just speak the words of life. Speak his name. Just say Jesus. 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 There's a prayer in that. There's a sermon in that. There's everything you know just in that one name. Father, thank you for this story. It's true, this is an actual happened. There was a man named Jairus who did have a 12-year-old daughter. She did die and was brought back to life by your son. There was a woman, we don't know her name, but you do. She had an issue of blood 12 years and she didn't get better until your son touched her. This really happened, Lord, and the reality of the past can be for us the reality of the present and the future may it be so. May we come to know this Jesus the way Jairus' daughter did and Jairus and his wife did and the way this woman with the issue of blood did and others have. May we grow in our love for you and our understanding and our knowledge and grace and knowledge. Help us, Lord, to do these things, to go out deeper and to draw closer to you. For we ask these things. We ask to grow closer. We ask you to help us to love you more, to love each other more, to have more faith in who you are, what you are, what you did, what you said, what is written in your word. Cause us to grow, Lord, that we may be pleasing to you. Bless us now, Lord, in the remainder of this day. Bless this people in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God.